I have sat anonymously in this beautiful nave on many trips to New York, but today I feel drawn so much closer to your parish for the fact that Michael Kurth, Margaret McGee, Brandon Ashcraft, three seminarians sent from this community are part of our life at Berkeley Divinity School at Yale where I serve. They are all seniors, they graduate this spring and move on to ordination for service in God's world and church. And then there's your new rector. Don't even get me started on your new rector. 20 years ago, green behind the ear, we were rookies down the hall from each other as associates at Trinity Church in Boston. And I thank you, Dean, for this invitation to be here with all of you on this first Sunday of Advent. And I remind you that the scriptures tell us that when much is given, much is expected. And I look forward to seeing what God does in and through all of you in the years to come. This morning, I want to think together about two things. What we need this Advent for ourselves, for our souls, and what we have to share with the world around us. Please remain seated. Let us pray. O oh God, in the stillness of this worship, may we grow more sure of you. You are often closest to us when we feel you've forgotten us. The toil and thought of daily life leave us but little time to think of you. But though we may forget you, you never forget us. So now as we withdraw a while from all without, May we find you anew within. So lead us back to meet you where we may have missed you before. Amen. Advent is the season of light, and it's a season for our soul. It arrives when the world in this hemisphere darkens. December light is beautiful in its bleakness, the golden afternoon sun silhouetted by black spindly trees. Radiant pink and orange sunsets shimmer between tall buildings in the late afternoon. Roses shrivel on the vine and the earth rests. Neighborhoods grow dark early, ovens are lit, Fires burn, candles, and we go inside. The Advent wreath here before us this morning has a wonderful origin. Ending its productive season, the wheel falls off the harvest wagon and is taken inside, turned on its side, and covered with pine and berries and candles and lit to mark this time of waiting that we now are in the midst of. In the gospel lesson we just heard, Mark is warning those who are listening to him that we do not know what is coming. We do not know what the future holds. We do not know how long our life will be. We do not know how long the world will last. And to this loss of control over the future, he says, keep alert, keep awake, keep watch, wait. Why all the waiting in Advent? I hate waiting in lines. I hate waiting in traffic jams. I hate waiting for a phone call or a taxi. I hate waiting for someone to answer a text. I hate to wait while someone puts their shoes on. 
I hate to wait for a table. I hate to wait in line for a rental car. Some days, a long stoplight even irritates me. Ridiculous. All of this waiting and watching when we are busier than ever, our holiday events and schedules, overbuying, overeating, we're overscheduled. So is Advent sort of in the way? Because certainly Christmas we understand. The giving and receiving of gifts, all the familiar lessons and carols, the gorgeous decorations. Why, if it's so important, does Advent fall at the time of year we can least pay attention to it? Step into quiet and peace when every part of life, from the financial world to homeless shelters, from term papers due to a musician's holiday schedule, it demands our attention. So we might wonder, is Advent one of those things in the church that are for people holier than me? People more patient, people with more time, people free from all the doubts and uncertainties that I have. Is the church out of touch with my life to put Advent now? No, not this time. Advent gives us something beyond our to-do lists. Advent gives us something we cannot achieve. In the lessons and hymns and royal colors, in the tranquility, it rescues us from submitting every fraction of our life to standards of function and utility and commerce. It reminds us who we are, a person with a soul, formed with an unseen spiritual essence that connects us to God. Bank accounts dry up. Properties are flattened by hurricanes. Our net worth can't be taken away. Our net worth is God's gift, the irreducible dignity at the core of our being given us in baptism. God is the still center of this season's storm who lays a hand on our striving, on our worry, who knows the hurt and fear that we brought here with us today, the haunting blues and melancholy that are woven into this season for so many of us. Advent feeds the soul. Adrift in the frantic holiday season, it's Advent that centers us in what can never be taken away. No person No situation, no breakup, no bankruptcy, no prison, no addiction, no betrayal. Nothing can take away the gift we are reminded of, the gift we are invited to keep awake to. Nothing can take the soul out of us, but it needs to be fed or it grows very hungry. It can actually starve. And the food that lets it thrive is our willingness to give it time and attention. At the end of Thanksgiving Day, many years ago, I watched the movie Home Alone with my family in two commercials in Assaulted by holiday advertising, we pressed the mute button each time a commercial came on. So I invite you to press the mute button this Advent. Mute the static, the noise that keeps you from coming awake to God's love for you. 
that keeps you coming awake to the soul that possesses you. Commit your time this month. Slip into a church at midday for 15 minutes. Make time in the morning or evening or as you commute on the subway to read a meditation, to pray. Come to church the next three Sundays in Advent to be grateful, to ask for what you need, to remember who you are. Keep it simple and keep it real. Sometimes when we get quiet, it's very uncomfortable if we are used to being busy. But just stay with it. Nothing has to happen. You don't have to have any insights. It doesn't have to be holy or special. Just commit your time to it and let it take you where it takes you. Let the Spirit of God have your undivided attention. It is in our baptism where we are conferred with this inestimable value, with this dignity that belongs to our souls. And it is also in baptism that we have either made a commitment or one was made on our behalf to respect the dignity of every human being. The dignity that we receive is also the dignity that we have to give and to share. It's the dignity that we are judged by. Howard Thurman has this beautiful way of putting it, when the song of the angels is stilled, when the star in the night sky is gone, when the kings and the princes are home, when the shepherds are back with their flocks, the work begins to find the lost, to heal the broken, to feed the hungry, to release the prisoner, to rebuild the nations, to bring peace among people, to make music in the heart. The endemic of sexual misconduct all over the news, disrespect for the bodies of others, disregard for the earth, a presidential advisor found guilty of lying to the FBI, disregarding the law. That is what Isaiah is raging about in that lesson that we heard this morning. In his own era, he is crying out to God, Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down, so that the mountains would quake at your presence. Listen to this as when fire kindles brushwood and the fire causes water to boil. Make your name known so that the nations might tremble at your presence. Isaiah's God is not cozy. Isaiah's God is not our buddy no matter what we do or say or think when we leave church. God is riled up over predatory behavior, over tax laws that give it back to those who need it least. God's anger at our world is fierce as fire. The uncompromising nature of a highly differentiated divine being that judges our disregard for each other. Pope Francis this week had a come to Jesus moment or it seemed he had a come to Jesus moment. He visits Myanmar, cooperating with the Roman Catholic local authorities who don't want to make trouble. He's silent on behalf of the least dignified people of that land. And the next day, arriving in Bangladesh, he met with the Rohingya. He blessed them, he touched them, he asked for their forgiveness. 
It was a courageous decision to join hands with Muslims, Buddhists, and Christians, asking the Rohingya people to forgive the persecution and death and mistreatment. We won't look away. Pope Francis said, we won't close our hearts. Just like Jesus. Always going to the one who says, you're not welcome here, and says, come on in. Always going to the borderline of who we are willing to say welcome to, who we could actually see as a dignified person with the same dignity of soul that we've been given. And Pope Francis said the presence of God today is also called Rohingya. Not because he had any intention of converting them to Roman Catholicism, but because he saw, like Jesus was able to see with this extraordinary vision, that those who are least and who are outside belong in the same circle. We report to another authority than the political leaders of our day. We report to King Jesus. We report to an authority above those that we vote for as Christians. And how we live outside these walls matters. We sit in the royal hues of Advent, where rose and purple and blue grace the edges of God. Ices crack and shine. The night sky gleams sublime under unknown stars. And we keep watch and we stay awake. And we pray for the grace to cast away the works of darkness and put on the armor of light to guard our precious souls. The poet, writer Maria Rilke, all of these themes, it seems to me, are in his imagination when he gives us these words. And I'll close with them. If only for once it were still. If the not quite right and why this could be muted and the neighbor's laughter and the static my senses make, if all of it didn't keep me from coming awake, then in one vast thousand-fold thought I could think you up to where thinking ends. I could possess you, even for the brevity of a smile, and offer you in gladness to all that lives. Amen.